This is Adel Gasly. I'm going to present you part five of the chapter about DC machines. In this part, I will cover the power flow and efficiency, then the torque speed characteristics of different DC machines, and finally, the starting issues of DC machines. To analyze the power flow in a DC machine, let us consider the example of a DC compound motor, which is the most complete and complex because it includes two field windings, the shunt and series winding. The other cases can be easily analyzed using a similar approach. The idea here is to start from the power input side, which is the source in this case, and go through the circuit in steps until we reach the final output power delivered to the load. In the case of motor, the input power is electrical and the output power is mechanical. So the input power in this case is defined by the product of the terminal voltage VT and the terminal current IT. So if we follow this terminal current, we can see that it goes through the series resistance RS leading to generation of copper losses defined by IT square RS. So these losses are subtracted from the input power and the remaining power is VAIT and we reach the shunt field and armature windings. So the terminal current will split into two components, a shunt field current and an armature current. In the shunt field winding, the field current flows in the total equivalent field resistance RF, causing shunt field copper losses equal to IF square RF. And on the other side, the armature current will flow in the armature winding resistance RA, causing armature copper losses, IA square RA. So the remaining power is determined by EA, IA, where EA is the back EMF. This remaining armature electric power will be converted into a mechanical power, TD omega M, that is developed based on the principle of electromechanical energy conversion. Here, TD is the developed torque and omega M is the speed of rotation of the armature. However, because of core losses and mechanical rotational losses, the effective output torque that is delivered to the shaft or the load is less than the actual developed torque. Therefore, the output mechanical power, T out omega M, received by the mechanical load is less than the total developed mechanical power. This output mechanical power is also called shaft power. What we have discussed in the previous slide was the case of a motor. For the case of a compound generator, we can obtain this power flow chart. In this case, the input power is mechanical and the output power is electrical. The first losses are the rotational losses, which are mechanical losses. Then the remaining mechanical power is converted into electric power through electromechanical energy conversion principle. The electric losses are similar to those seen for the case of a motor. So we have armature circuit losses, shunt field winding losses, and series winding losses. Finally, the output electric power is VTIT. So as I mentioned earlier, we can follow the same procedure using the equivalent circuits of the different types of DC machine, and we can easily develop the diagram or power flow diagram inside any DC machine being a motor or a generator. Now, based on the previous power flow diagrams, it is easy to find the efficiency of the machine by taking the ratio of the output power over the input power. By considering the output power as the input power minus the losses, we can write that the efficiency is equal to one minus the ratio of total losses in the machine over the input power. Now, replacing the input power by its expression as VT multiplied by AT for the motor case, and considering that total losses are the sum of the copper losses in all resistances and the rotational losses, we can rewrite the expression of the efficiency as in here. Finally, we can also write the expression of the efficiency as a function of the armature back AMF and current, terminal voltage and current, and rotation losses as in here.
So depending on what variables are known and what variables are unknown, we can have several expressions of the efficiency which should lead all to the same result. Now let us determine the relation between the DC machine torque and speed variables, which is called a torque speed characteristic. We shall start first with the separately excited and Chan DC motors. For this case, we know that the field flux is independent of the load current and hence the load torque. Then going back to equations of the machine and that we have developed in the previous part of this chapter, we can deduce the expression of the speed as shown here. Using the expression of the developed torque, we can find the speed expression as a function of the developed torque as shown here. Notice that this equation represents a line with a negative slope, which can be plotted as shown in this figure. At no load, which means the torque is zero, the speed is equal to Vt over Ka phi. The slope of speed decline is Ra over Ka phi square. Notice here that the higher the armature resistance, the larger is the slope. So if you want to have a very small slope and operate the machine at almost constant speed independently from the low torque, we need to design a machine with very small armature resistance. This is feasible with large machines in which the winding cross-section area can be increased. However, for small size machines, because of space limitation, it is very difficult to use thick wires. So it is clear that we can control the DC motor speed by varying its armature voltage, field flux, and armature resistance. Note that varying the armature resistance is not an efficient way of speed control since it adds more copper losses into the armature when we increase the armature resistance. While controlling the voltage using power electronic converters has become the most efficient and practical way of controlling the speed and torque of DC machines. For the series motor, if we neglect the field saturation with the increase in the field current, which is also the armature current, then we can write the flux as a constant K1 multiplied by the armature current. And considering the expression of the back EMF and replacing the field flux by its expression as a function of the armature current, we can write this equation, where the product of armature current Ka and the feed constant K1 can be merged into one constant called Ks. Now, if you apply the KVL to the circuit, we can obtain this equation, which can be combined with the previous one to lead to this equation. We can also develop the relation between the developer torque and armature current as shown here. Now, combining these two equations, we can obtain the torque speed relation as shown by this equation. Notice here that the speed is inverse proportional to the square root of the torque. At standstill, the torque is high, and at high speed, the torque becomes very small. That is why this type of machine is suitable for drilling and traction applications. Besides, it is important to note that the series motor should not be operated at no load. If the torque is zero, the speed tends to increase excessively above its rated value and that can be very dangerous. Notice that the speed control can be performed by varying the armature terminal voltage or the armature resistance. However, the voltage control could be more practical and efficient speed control method thanks to the advent of power electronics converters. Therefore, there should be always a minimum load on the DC series motor shaft. For the compound DC motor type, we have two cases, the cumulative and differential compounds, which differ in the calculation of the total field flux resulting from the shunt and series windings. The derivation of the expression of the speed as a function of the torque in this case is much more complex 
because of the flux component where that of the shunt winding is independent of the torque while that of the series winding depends on the torque. However, we can express it in general by this equation knowing that the total flux phi t is dependent on the torque. For instance, the, for cumulative compound, the total flux will increase with the torque and thus the speed will decrease. While for the differential case, the total flux will decrease when the torque increases, which leads to an increase in the speed. Notice that again, the speed control can be performed by varying the terminal voltage or the armature resistance or the field current. However, the voltage control is more practical and efficient thanks to the use of power electronics converters. In summary, we can plot all characteristics on one figure so that we can easily compare them. These different torque speed characteristics make different classes of motors fit into specific applications. For instance, the shant or separately excited motor is suitable for applications where the mechanical load speed does not depend on the torque such as lifts. While the series motor is suitable for high starting torque machines such as drills and traction applications. Now we are going to study the issue of starting of DC motors. As we have seen earlier, we have this equation of armature current that applies to almost all types and classes of DC motors. Since at standstill, it means that when the rotor is not rotating, the rotor or armature speed is zero, the back EMF is also zero. So the starting current becomes equal to the terminal voltage divided by the armature resistance. So if a DC motor is directly connected to a DC power supply, the starting current will be dangerously high since RA is usually very small. This is a serious issue that should be carefully addressed. To overcome this issue and limit the starting current to its maximum acceptable value, which is the rated value, we can proceed in two different ways. The first one is by using a variable voltage supply. The voltage is increased slowly so that the back EMF can build up with the increase of the speed. Note that the mechanical system has a certain inertia that limits the speed variation. That is why the mechanical speed variation does not follow the same speed of voltage and current variation in the armature. So when the speed increases, the back EMF follows the same increase and thus the armature current decreases. Therefore, we can increase gradually the terminal voltage while keeping the armature current within a safe range. In the second method, we insert an external resistance in series with the armature circuit in order to increase the total equivalent armature resistance, which will limit the armature current to its rated value. However, if we keep the same resistance, the speed of the motor will not increase to its rated value. So we need to gradually decrease its external additional resistance until we finally remove it uh, completely when the motor speed reaches its rated value. Both starting strategies could be performed manually or automatically. For instance, let us see how the second method can be implemented manually. The external resistance starter is usually designed as shown in this figure. The starter's handle is initially placed on the zero or off position. In this case, the armature circuit is open and there is no armature current. When the handle is moved to position 1, the armature circuit becomes a closed circuit and the total external resistance between terminal 1 and 5 is inserted in series with the armature circuit. So the current will jump to a certain value I1 that can be limited by appropriate choice of the equivalent total resistance value. So the interaction between this armature starting current and the feed flux will generate a starting torque which will start the rotation of the rotor. While the speed of the rotor is increasing, the back EMF will be also increasing, the armature current will start decreasing. 
When it reaches a certain value I2, we move the handle to position 2. So the current will jump to I1 again if the resistance between terminal 1 and 2 is selected accordingly. Again, the current will decrease to I2, and then we move to the handle to position 3, which makes the current jumps back to I1. We continue the same procedure until we short circuit the whole external resistance and disconnect completely this resistance from the armature circuit. At that time, the speed and armature current would have reached their steady state values, which depend on the mechanical load. So with this method, we can have a smooth and safe starting of the DC motor. This method was used to be considered less expensive than the voltage variation method. However, the insertion of external resistance in the armature circuit increases the copper losses and decreases the efficiency of the machine at starting. While with the variable terminal voltage method, the copper losses do not increase and hence the efficiency of the motor at starting is much better. Nowadays, with the recent development of power electronics, a soft starter with variable DC power supply became more practical and economical, especially that it can be also used for speed control of the DC machine. This is the end of this part. Thank you for watching.